welcome to the founders of Web3 series by Outlier Ventures and me, your host, Jamie Burke. Together, we're going to meet the entrepreneurs, their backers, and the leading policymakers that are shaping Web3. Together, we're going to try to define what is Web3, explore its nuances, and understand the mission and purpose that drive its founders. If you enjoy what you hear, please do subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission that is Web3. Great. So today we've got Carl Samani of Multicoin Capital uh, with us. Last time I saw you, I think it was in China when it was fashionable to say that you were in China back in December. So it was either kind of just before everything went into lockdown or or maybe um, maybe in the middle of it. I can't quite remember. But um, actually, despite coming across you and, and having the opportunity to see in a number of different social settings, we've never really had the opportunity to sit down and, and go deep into something. So this is something I'm really looking forward to doing. So welcome on the show. Hey, Jamie, thanks so much for being on the show. Glad glad to be here. So as I was saying, there are a number of different things that we could have talked about today. You've been putting out some really great uh, thought leadership uh, across a number of areas, notwithstanding your work helping define the Web3 stack and iterations of it. But more recently, you've done some really interesting posts on infinite scale, and then um, your team put out something around uh, trust spectrum or the trust spectrum. So what I wanted to try to do is, given it's only 45 minutes or so, is is to kind of focus in on one of those, primarily trust spectrum, because whilst I know it was meant to be um, a way to analyze different products and services out there and and move away from looking at things as centralized or or decentralized. So that's kind of what I I want to really focus in on. But equally, I think it would be great to kick off talking a little bit around infinite scale, because I think, you know, most investors or people entering the space, the one thing they don't associate with, with what I would define as Web3 is scale. And I think you put forward a really good argument as to how actually the potential for um, networks that can have incentives and disincentives baked into them is the potential to achieve not only a scale beyond what's possible with platforms in Web2 today, but quicker. So, so it'd be great to understand the kind of the thinking behind infinite scale. Yeah. So, you know, there's this really good um, Charlie Munger quote. Uh, Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's business partner. And I think the quote is, show me the incentives and I'll show you the results or I'll show you the outcomes, I think. Uh, something to that effect. And obviously, he's just basically saying that incentives drive, you know, basically all kind of human behavior. And so what I find so compelling about crypto and Web3 is that it is really the most direct way humanity has ever invented to explicitly codify incentives into software. And that software is cryptographically enforced. Um, and I find that to be extraordinarily elegant. Um, and, and really like profound and, and clear in its kind of thinking and reasoning. And, and so, and like, again, if you're already in crypto, like you're already probably bought into that because that kind of ethos, generally speaking, drives crypto. So uh, I, I just find that, that, that kind of an abstract, I really like to think about Web3 um, in, that, in that sense. What I've kind of discovered over the last few years of being in crypto is that there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding of how to think about these networks. Um, and the kind of the most common one is that these things can't scale. Um, looking at kind of scaling layer one blockchain, so things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, is an extraordinarily difficult technical problem. But, but the kind of point of the infinite scale post is not to focus on scaling layer one consensus. Instead, the focus of that post was really to look at how do we create systems that can incentivize that we're, simply by encoding, you know, incentives and disincentives into software. How can we kind of create self-organizing ecosystems where as as sub- demand grows for some commodity service supply just self-organizes based on the rules of the protocol. And I, as I kind of thought through that, it became very clear to me that big, that really mining today for proof of work protocols is the first large scale instantiation of that behavior where there, right, there is no mining ink. There is no, uh, when anyone who kind of governs how that stuff works, it just so happens that these protocols say, if you hash enough, then you get, you know, coins, right? And it turns out some people want to buy those coins. And so um, there's, it's kind of this very just emergent phenomena where you have this just now enormous industry around mining that is completely self-organized as a kind of a derivative of the fact that let's say Bitcoin and Ethereum use proof of work. I've realized in kind of further thought then is that this model is really going to drive 
how we scale a lot of Web3 services. Uh, and so in the, in the infinite scale post, I think I'll highlight two or three other um, examples, uh, which include LivePeer, uh, Arweave, and I think Helium. And what I kind of observed with each of these other networks, which full disclosure, we are investors in each of those three, is that these things are kind of similar and that the, the folks who created these protocols realized that you need large numbers of, distant, of you know, people who don't trust each other, who are located all over the world, you need all these people to, to rationally agree and participate and follow the rule of some protocol. And all of them have designed ways where you can basically detect or the public at large can detect, hey, is person A or person B following the rules correctly? Um, and if so, reward them. And if not, penalize them in some way. And I've kind of realized that, that, that if you can actually design a, a, a verification and an economic game around that, you can incentivize people to basically scale um, any, sir, any commodity service you can think of from computation to video transcoding, to procuring bandwidth, to storage, to whatever. And, and so that model, I, I find that, and if you can design that economic game correctly, then you don't actually need to have a massive DevOps team and scale out some sort of big monolithic centrally managed service. Instead, you have to just design that game correctly, which is a very um, sensitive, challenging thing to do. But if you can design that game correctly, then all you need the blockchain for is, the blockchain is basically the place to coordinate the, the players of the game. And once you coordinate the players of the game, all of the other activity just ha kind of happens organically off chain. And that should be able to scale in theory to basically infinity for any of these major services. And what I really liked about it was the articulation that not only will it allow much greater scale, but that it allows that to happen quicker because of the incentive, because innovation can happen at the edges and because of the composability of, uh, of I guess, this stack that we're building. So, you know, I mean, I, I know that you and I and maybe a number of others have, have kind of always believed in this. And perhaps what I'm seeing now is there, there seems to be, certainly in the last 12 months, a lot of people are retreating away from the idea of tokens in that context because of the messiness that happened around ICOs. And so a number of the use cases that you mentioned, and I, I also kind of subscribe to the idea that really that could be applied um, to any kind of game with any kind of optimization function. Why hasn't that happened yet? You know, why is it only really the Bitcoin game that's reached scale? And is there a is there a sequence of games that need to happen to build out the, the infrastructure to make it possible for other games? Yeah, so the really hard part about designing these games is kind of designing that. The, the economics is, is challenging, it's, it's certainly not trivial, but I think generally speaking, the hardest part in designing these games is, is, the, is the verification problem. Meaning that in order for any of these games to work in a permissionless setting, you need that the public at large um, can verify, you know, if person A says I did X, whatever X is supposed to be, the public at large needs to be able to verify that, you know, person A did, uh, it did the function X correctly. Um, and so they need to be able to verify that they did it correctly or they need, and, and they need to be able to verify that the person did that job incorrectly. And you need to be able to prove both of those things, right? If you're going to give this, if this person some sort of reward for doing the job correctly, you need proof or at least highly prob probabilistic certainty that the person did the thing they said they did. Um, and conversely, if you're going to slash that person for lying, you probably need pretty strong proof that that person lied because you don't want to be slashing people arbitrarily. And, and designing those types of, of technical verification games for different types of, of jobs is, is actually pretty difficult. In the case of Bitcoin, it turns out that ha hashing has this very nice property where, where, right, like it's very easy for someone to verify the result of a hash, but it's very difficult to guess what the, but it's basically impossible to guess what a hash will produce. And so because you have this kind of nice mathematical asymmetry um, of, of hash functions, it's trivial for anyone to verify proof of work, right? Um, but it's very difficult to run the proof of work. And so that, that asymmetry mathematically lends itself very well to, towards this game. If you look at something like LivePeer, for example, the verification game is, is a little bit more difficult. Um, where they kind of have to play a game of basically probabilistically checking um, uh, encoded video frames from whoever says they're transcoding these frames. And you know, there's some kind of advanced um, photo and video analysis of figuring out, hey, have people modified these images uh, and kind of coming to those types of conclusions probabilistically. Arweave is similar in that they had to kind of devise this unique game they call proof of access, which lives on top of proof of work. Uh, and then if you look at Helium, he Helium is actually very, very complex because Helium is actually tying the verification game to real world physics. Um, in this case of Helium, they're actually trying to say, you need this hotspot needs to prove that it was providing wireless coverage at this time and at this place to these other, other hotspots. 
Um, and so coming up with a, a cryptographic verification game where you can actually verify the presence of specific radio frequencies at a specific place and point in time, um, and then prove that to the public at large um, is, is a non-trivial thing. And so kind of Helium has devised a game to you know, try and make those proofs possible. Um, a lot of the cutting edge research generally happening in the Web3 communities today is basically on figuring out ways to prove things and prove things to the public at large such that you can make um, you can either reward people for honest behavior or slash people for dishonest behavior. Well, I was listening to a podcast you did recently um, with Blockstack, and I, I also liked the statement that you were mentioning around there only needs this only needs to be probabilistic, right? You, you don't need, in many instances, um, actually too many projects are spending too much time on uh, the extreme to which things can be verified to the point that it's, it's causing friction in actually executing something that is, is, is usable. Yeah, you're, you're generally right. I mean, a lot of people who get into the ethos of crypto, you know, the ultimate probably guarantee is cryptographic guarantee, um, which cryptographic guarantee is basically, you know, generally speaking, one over two to the 256, which is you know, effectively zero, right, or, or perfect. It, it's generally pretty hard to get to that degree of certainty. But unfortunately, a lot of people in crypto, because that is kind of the level of certainty you get from, say, just key management, that's the same type, of, same type of guarantee a lot of people strive for. But in reality, even if you're, you're one one trillionth of that, or even you know one one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of that, like you're still probably okay, you know, probabilistically. Um, and so sometimes I do fear that people let perfection stand in the way of good enough. And so this is quite a nice segue into the the trust spectrum. So as I understand it, you are offering a way to uh, initially assess. The, the the verifiability of a product or a service, primarily around custody, custody of assets, uh, and to, uh, to move away from this kind of fairly meaningless centralization or decentralization. And so could you kind of talk us through that? As I understand it, you, you've got custody, immutability, verifiable security, legal and reg, and insurance. Can you, can you walk us through that as a means of analyzing something? And, you know, I, I think within that, as I interpret it anyway, this isn't necessarily advocating for one or the other. It's saying that in different instances, in different use cases, you will make different trade-offs. And so I'm assuming that this says different flavors can coexist, perhaps sh- should coexist. Yeah. So um, by the way, full disclosure, I am not the, I was the primary author of the Infinite Scale post. I was not the primary author of the Trust Spectrum post. My colleagues, um, Ben and Tony wrote the Trust Spectrum post. Um, I, I was certainly involved in, in kind of the editing process, but but I want to make sure that credit is there for <laughs> primary authors. Very honorable. So well, as I think about kind of the, the when you talk to people in crypto about trust minimization and you know, people say it's trustless or trust minimized, what they're typically referring to is custody risk, uh, meaning that for the most part, these crypto things, the kind of primary benefit of them is that they allow people to maintain custody of their assets because they can hold the private keys and still you know, lock or unlock or move around assets or whatever. And, and what we kind of realized through over the last couple of years of just lots and lots of discussions about decentralized exchanges and lending platforms or whatever is, is that those things were not binary or, or rather that while the, the custody, non-custody uh, element is binary, there are a lot of other kind of secondary and tertiary considerations. Um, and, and, you know, as a, a hedge fund in the space, we, you know, are, can be a theoretical customer of a lot of these products and services. And so we obviously, as fiduciaries, you know, have thought through, hey, do we want to expose our investors' funds to, to the risks of these protocols? And in many cases, we actually deduced that the answer was no, we do not want to take on risk, even though, you know, theoretically, we have the private keys that control the assets. And so kind of as a result of thinking through that over the last couple of years, it it kind of dawned on us that we needed to come up with a more comprehensive framework to think about the problem. Um, And that that kind of the result of that thinking is is encoded in this uh, essay that Tony and Ben wrote. When I, when I think about on a long time horizon, when I think about the, the, the custody, non-custody perspective, um, my favorite analogy to think through historically is the, the native application versus web application kind of divide for anyone who kind of remembers software in the nineties, right? Like the web, for anyone who was building real applications that were working, they were primarily database applications. There were games to some degree. Those were kind of the two primary applications out there. Um, the overwhelming majority of applications were built as you know, native, native code hooked up to typically a, a database served, served on the local network. And I remember in the early days of the web, you know, 98 through call it 2002, 2003, there was a really common framing from, the, from people who built native applications 
that web applications will never match the performance of native applications. And their kind of basis for that statement was technically correct. I mean, serving things over the, over the, you know, the internet is much slower, um, like bandwidth is slower, memory access. I mean, everything is just slower. HTML is like a, a you know, another layer of abstraction on top of the browser, on top of the operating system. So for all kinds of pretty obvious technical reasons, the statement, you know, was correct that web applications would always be less performant than native applications. But of course the, the benefit, right? If you like, if you think about Salesforce who kind of really represented the, the movement, the, they were the first major player to move towards SaaS and their, their like feature tagline or whatever for like years was no software. And I remember being confused by that statement. I was like, what do you mean? Like, it's obviously software. Like I clicked the buttons on the screen. Um, but what they were referring to, of course, was that, that you don't have to locally manage and install your software and that everything just kind of magically updates in the cloud and that, you know, they handle you know, concurrency and DevOps and all these things, right? And so there was kind of this big step function change between hosting everything yourself and dealing with upgrades and, and DevOps um, and administration versus outsourcing all that to someone else uh, and then having to deal with you know, worse native performance uh, because of just the fact that you're rendering the browser and, and bandwidth and the kind of obvious constraints. And when I look at the, the custody, no custody debate in crypto, I, I kind of see a similar type of, of uh, paradigm shift where you get this fundamentally breakthrough feature that was not possible before. Um, in the case of the web, it was you know SaaS and cloud and all those things. You know, no administration, no headache. Uh, in the case of, of crypto, it's it's custody versus no custody. But the downside is that you kind of have like stepped backwards for basically everything else. Insurance is like totally undefined in any form of legal recourse. Um, these protocols are like buggy because they're new. We don't actually know. Like sometimes they claim to be immutable, but they're not. And so like we have this kind of this thing that I think a lot of people in crypto find to be pretty obvious, which is a step function breakthrough of, of custodial versus non-custodial. But there's just all these drawbacks that you can just kind of generally say are like performance, right? Like they just it doesn't work as well for real real world applications. Um, it is literally impossible today to re reproduce just the scale of Binance or BitMEX or Coinbase on DeFi. Like it's laughable to even make the assertion that it's possible to have DeFi operate at the scale of any one of those exchanges, let alone all of those exchanges together, right? Because there's just so many kind of performance limitations in the systems. And so uh, I, I look at, at DeFi in this kind of similar lens where on a long time horizon, I, I expect things will arch in that direction because you have this kind of asymmetric paradigm shift improvement of custody versus non-custody, but there's just so many other things that you need to get perfectly and that it just takes time to get there. What's really interesting is if you look at right, like the history of the web, you know, by like 2010, it started to become kind of apparent that, uh, you know, we would have like broad based web applications, but even like until recently, like really advanced design applications didn't live in the browser. Um, so things like architecture software, things like, like Webflow, like those really were only possible in the last kind of two or three years. And those were not possible even five or six years ago. And so the highest levels of performance, um, just, it just takes a long time to get there in the kind of the new paradigm model. And so I expect this transition from CFI to DeFi, you know, it's gonna take a decade or longer. Um, and along the way, we're gonna have all kinds of problems around immutability, around verifiable security um, and insurance. But I, I do expect the arc of history will, will take us in the decentralized direction. So one of the ways that I've been talking about it recently is the idea that, you know, what we've now got is this permissionless sandbox where innovation can happen almost outside of a jurisdiction. It's kind of a, extraterritoriality where projects can innovate rapidly. And so, again, you know, if you, if you look at, I think it was you that mentioned the amount of products that Binance have rolled out is just impossible for any regulated financial services company, let alone, uh, let alone anybody else. Now, they're able to do that because of the regulatory arbitrage that they play. But presumably, you know, that's only for a narrow you know, piece of the market. And so there's perhaps this interplay where the, the boundaries of what's possible are pushed in this permissionless space, but increasingly those innovations are then reversed into, you know, the regulated environment. And so, I mean, do, do you see DeFi eating into the centralized, you know, financial services world, or do you see it really as a place which which kind of eats away or, or, or where innovations happen that get fed back into, into the machine? So I think the answer is a little bit of both. I look at organizations like Binance, where Binance is extremely ethos aligned with, with the vision of crypto. Um, yes, it is, it is a centralized exchange today. And like it is, it has all the things that look like a centralized exchange. 
but you can see them tinkering with all these decentralized things. And I, I really genuinely believe that CZ and the organization there want to decentralize themselves in the long run. And a lot of conversations I've had with, with the team there, I think that's the vision they want to move towards. And so I think the kind of interesting dichotomy in the long run is going to be, who are the winners? Are the winners in DeFi 10 or 15 years from now, are they new pure play DeFi protocols that started off you know, with, with let's say no custody? Um, or is it folks like Binance who started off with custody um, and then were able to take, you know, pivot and adjust their user bases and their applications over a period of time to make the transition from, uh, you know, custodial to non-custodial. Um, and I think that's kind of the big question that kind of DeFi faces kind of existentially in terms of, I don't want to say existentially, but it's the big question of who is going to capture the value in this, in, this, in this new model. And I'm actually inclined to think that organizations like Binance are going to pull it off. There's large examples in history, like Microsoft, for example, you know, famously failed to really figure out the internet, right, until really Azure in the last five years or so. Uh, but for the 15 years or so, the internet era, Microsoft did not know what to do. And, and so I, I understand that the reason, to, the argument that pure play uh, folks are better positioned. In the case of Binance, it's clear that like the ethos of the people who work there, from the leadership all the way down to the employees, understand the vision. They existentially understand the challenge of, of having a central centralized entity. Um, you can see this from the number of times Binance has had to move its, its you know, legal jurisdiction around. And, and the fact that you know, they launched in China and then two months later, China banned crypto, right? Like, like that's very much embedded in the DNA of the company. And, and so I think they understand that in a very deep way, the value of that. What does it mean to be decentralized? Uh, and that, therefore they're gonna push themselves in that direction. Will the same thing happen for, for Coinbase or for Kraken or for Bact or for Fidelity? Uh, probably less clear, given the regulatory regimes in which those, those entities operate. But uh, for someone like Binance, probably, I, I think that's actually what I would expect them to do. Um, that's, nailing the timing of that is very difficult. There will certainly be kind of missteps along the way. All of this stuff is brand new. And, and Binance, more than any other entity specifically, is trying to transition this, uh, make this transition at scale. Binance is really, I would argue, the only at scale entity trying to make this kind of a transition at, at all. Right. Folks like Maker and Compound are trying to do this now, but the scale at which they operate is, is a fraction of what, what Binance is, is doing. And so it, it's very much TBD if they'll pull that off. And, and so that's kind of my kind of, you know, super macro framing of how to think about this. Having said all of the above, we are obviously very public and bullish on BNB and, and Binance, uh, but we've also invested in other centralized exchanges and in pure play DeFi protocols as well. So I, I don't mean to, to harp too much on them. And that I do think there will be some pure play DeFi protocols that will matter, but it's very unclear to me if there's going to be one or two super mega winners, I think it's more likely that it looks like a Binance than it does like a, like a compound. Right. And I guess at this stage, it probably makes sense to hedge on, you know, the, the direction. So um, whether it's going to be, you know, from, from one end of your spectrum around custody to the other. So, I mean, I, it, it sounds like that if, if we were talking about Web3 and we were trying to define it, that trust is at the center of that. So that the closest you know, reference point would be the trust web or, or, or web of trust. And the idea that the problem with the web today is that we have agents, but we can't verify things about them. So almost the terms of service are implicit um, rather than explicit. And there is this lack of revocability for for the user. But if you're if you're a participant like Binance, which is at one end of the spectrum, I guess in that context, if it is primarily around trust and about being able to verify things, I guess one of the ironies, and this isn't specific to Binance actually, but one of the ironies generally for this space is that it's very opaque. Now, how much do you think that impacts their ability to execute? Because, I mean, from my perspective, it feels like a lot of the opaqueness is largely driven from this need to obfuscate around regulatory arbitrage. You know, you, you don't want to reveal too much about how something functions in order that you can outmaneuver or at least buy a period of freedom where you're, where, when you're trying to engage with, with regulators. But at the same time, that trade-off is then that you, you weaken the ability to, to, to verify certain things about how you, how you operate. Yeah, so it's a really interesting debate. And I, I guess one that I, I have less concern overall than probably most, let's say, crypto enthusiasts. So even if you just, let's just take centralized exchanges because they're kind of the obvious um, types of players to, to use this question to focus on. On one extreme, you've got, let's say, Coinbase. And on the other, you've got, let's say, Binance or BitMEX. I'll kind of think about those three examples separately. 
with Coinbase, you know, we don't actually know that much formally. Um, Coinbase is not a publicly traded company. You know, they don't produce financial statements. They don't have audits of these things. We generally take their word for it because they are, they seem to be good faith actors. They do seem to engage with regulators. They do seem to do things above board. You know, I think every interaction you have with Coinbase generally is probably an above board interaction. Full disclosure, Multicoin Capital is a customer of Coinbase Custody. Or like we know lots of folks at Coinbase and we obviously like doing business with them. And so there's that, but we, we can't verify things. And certainly as, as a retail trader, even things like proof of custody, right? We don't actually, those things are not publicly available. We, yeah, we knew Coinbase's address. We know like they're in San Francisco or whatever, but there's a lot of things that you don't know operationally. If you look at Binance, you have more obfuscation um, in terms of like call it where is HQ formally. The answer kind of sort of seems to be that like there isn't one. It's a lot of people who work from home on Telegram. Right. It kind of seems to be the answer for anyone who interacts with Binance. You kind of pick up on that pretty quickly. And, and so it's it's different. They, you know, similarly do not provide, you know, proof of custody to the public at large. Um, but everyone who tries to deposit and withdraw funds is generally pretty happy with the experience. And that's why every major market participant today really tra- trades on Binance for a reason. So the, the question, like coming back to your verify verif- verification question is like, okay, well, what does it matter in which HQ are they are they located in? Binance today, the substantial majority of capital they interact with is all running on crypto payment rails anyways, whether that's Tether or USDC or DAI or Bitcoin or Ether or whatever, right? All those things don't care about which jurisdiction you're in because they're crypto native. And, and so like, if you're only dealing with crypto anyways, like the answer is, does it really matter? I've never asked anyone at Binance this question, but I suspect if I ask them, why do you guys even have a legal entity at all? I suspect the answer is because they interact with some regulators, you know, they have to out on ramps in Singapore and, you know, parts of the EU and, you know, all over the world, they needed some entity there. Um, but if you, let's say, live in the U.S. and there's no direct U.S. on ramp anyways, like, do you actually care? And uh, it's not clear to me that, that you do. And if that's the case, then, then what guarantees is Coinbase providing you that Binance is not, um, given that what you can see of all other market participants, you know, in, in the space. And so um, I just, it's not clear to me that, that you're getting meaningfully better guarantees from, let's say, Coinbase um, than you are from Binance. I'm not saying that there's no better guarantees, but it, it seems somewhat, it seems hard to, to make the case that it's like that much better that you're getting strong, you know, verifiable guarantees. And, and then if you like take this to further down, let's say to BitMEX, you get even fewer guarantees there. But, but I think you kind of get the, the point I'm making is that it's all pretty gray. And, and so, and again, this is no, no fault of Coinbase, uh, to be clear. I think it's just the reality of the fact that they're not a publicly traded company. And if they were, then obviously that would change things. But private companies kind of have this luxury. And so, and it's very clear empirically that the market at large does not care. And I think that's, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, again, I think this will eventually change. I think if we had the ability to have verifiable in real time, decentralized, magical things with, with non-custodial trading, I think people would move in that direction. Um, but tech is not there to do it yet. And so... Uh, I think that's okay, but we're all we're all moving in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, it, the conversations that I've had with lawyers, um, sadly, far too many uh, over the years. But the, you know, the reason why you might choose a jurisdiction is because if you don't, then in theory, you're liable in any jurisdiction, including Saudi Arabia or, or Russia or places you you really don't want to be getting in trouble. But I I, I totally kind of take take the point. So it feels like a lot of the things that we've been talking about both in terms of the design challenges and the technologies that are being built are quite narrow. Um, So the kind of assets that these are are relevant to today. But do you think that this extends um, beyond kind of crypto assets and and cryptocurrency to other forms of digital assets, such as data and and the data economy? There's been, I think, a lot of, of, if you kind of take Web3 to its logical conclusion, which is, you know, everyone owns their own data. It lives on some server somewhere. It's encrypted. Someone has their private keys and, you know, they authorize applications to interact with their data. And this all happens in a very trust minimized way with lots of, of, you know, certificates and proofs and cryptography magic, right? Like every which way. Um, It's kind of relatively easy to sit here and kind of just assume all of those things get taken to the logical conclusion. And I think on a long enough time horizon, you can't actually take that for granted. It's not clear it's long enough here, five years or 10 years or 20 years. That's, That's much harder to say. And what, what are the exact kind of order of operations between here and there is also pretty difficult to, to develop a conviction on. But the end state is actually relatively easy to predict. And so the question is, is like, how does like all of the open data stuff fit into that? A, a lot of teams have pitched me and I'm sure have pitched you. I think you may be an investor in a couple around, you know, basically people monetizing their data directly or owning their data directly. Uh, and how does that kind of future play out? I am very optimistic there will be opportunities there. 
my biggest concern around all of the that stuff is that it's just too early. The infrastructure, just to own your own data, still does not really exist. Um, we're getting closer with Textile and Filecoin and Arweave getting more mature, but those things still have a ways to go. And then building kind of higher level monetization thing, like things like data marketplaces, for example, for AI training or whatever, you know, that just is another step right on top of that foundation. And I, I don't even think the foundation is there yet. So building higher level data monetization tools, I just, my biggest concern is that that stuff is five years away. It could happen tomorrow, but uh, I'm inclined to think that stuff is further away than it is, that is near. Um, and just given the, given the fact that I can't even see that infrastructure and play with it in my hands right at this moment, it's hard for me to, to make strong statements around when I think that stuff will become viable and what specific types of business models and data models are going to be you know, the ones that monetize best. Uh, it's just very hard to develop conviction there. And so is that why you, when you talk about your thesis, you always make this clear distinction between Web3 versus um, DeFi, OpenFi. So in your mind, if you, if you take out what, what you class as, as DeFi from Web3, what is Web3? How, how would you define it? Yeah, I mean, I'd say Web3 is about the series of, I mean, I think the most loose definition is things that use, that use permissionless crypto systems, uh, not for managing scarcity, but for managing abundance, right? Like, the, like all finance fundamentally is, is kind of bound by scarcity, right? Like can't spend the same coin twice, basically can't have the same stock twice or whatever. Um, and so those are all kind of scarcity bound applications. Um, there are, are a, a kind of fundamentally different set of applications that are not around using trust minimization to manage scarcity, but are around using trust minimization to, to manage some sort of, of uh, non-scarce resource. So like transcoding, for example, for life here kind of comes into that effect. I mean, there, there is some fixed amount of transcoders in the world, but um, that, that itself is dynamic, right? Like it's not like we can produce more silicon chips that transcode more videos. The same is true for something like Helium for provisioning internet access or whatever. Again, there is some fixed amount of bandwidth in the world, but the amount of bandwidth is growing. Um, but the point of, of scarcity things, right, is that you specifically don't want to change the monetary policies or the supply of those, of those types of assets. Um, and so I think of Web3 is kind of everything else um, that is not specifically bounded by scarcity. And then DeFi, conversely, is basically things that are bounded by scarcity, which basically means money for the most part. Money okay. and other, other um, you know, valuable assets. Right. Like stocks, bonds, those things. So to just jump back to the, the trust spectrum. So one of the things that we've advocated for for quite a while is what we've called um, a pathway to decentralization. I guess, you know, removing the word decentralization and looking at it in the context of your, your trust framework, your trust spectrum this idea of immutability. And do you think there's a question around at what stage you would design for what degree of immutability? So, you know, ultimately, if you think about immutability as the ability to change rules, as a, with everything that we know about lean startups and in, in our world, we're working with, you know, pre-seed, seed stage startups very, very early. And I know um, you, you work across all, all stages, but, do you think that there is an argument that some projects might start off on a certain place on your spectrum um, whilst they're looking for fit and then kind of migrate more towards uh, the other? Yeah. So uh, I, I think that, that these protocols um, will evolve over time. Absolutely. My friend Jesse Walden, who runs A16Z Startup School, uh, I think he wrote a really good essay about this a few months ago basically talking about how you want to you want to find product market fit first. You want to have basically the minimum viable decentralization to achieve product market fit. And once you do, then you want to start to build the community and then kind of fully decentralize over time. Right. And I, I generally think that's kind of the right model to, to think about. Um, and we have pretty good empirical evidence of this being the case if we look at the history of the two oldest big protocols, which are Bitcoin and Ethereum. The Bitcoin people, you know, like to kind of erase this from your history. But if you actually look at the history of Bitcoin, there's been a number of, of breaking changes in the system. Um, Satoshi introduced the one megabyte block limit uh, in 2010. It was not present in 2009 um, as basically a spam prevention tool because someone was spamming the system. All right. Um, and that, that turned out to have been, while it was backwards compatible, uh, like that was a very centralized decision um, that ended up creating this just massive arbitrary constraints. It is pretty reasonable to think that, you know, Satoshi did not intend that one megabyte limit to become, you know, effectively uh, the rule of God. For, for perpetuity thereafter. But it turns out that you know, the decision was made, probably made pretty quickly and arbitrarily, and just we've been stuck with it ever since then. 
there was like an overflow bug in Bitcoin at one point, I think in 2012 or something where like someone printed 10 billion Bitcoins, right? Like that happened. And so there had to be a hard fork to revert that. So there's been a number of, of breaking changes, but in general, Bitcoin, you know, you kind of codified the general idea of proof of work and the cryptography and the hash functions or whatever. Um, and then the system's kind of slowly decentralized over time. Um, Ethereum, you see a similar thing, like with the Dow hard fork being a good example of where there was like this very focal moment of centralization. Um, and then, you know, I think generally speaking, people recognize that Ethereum today is meaningfully more decentralized than it was, you know, three or four years ago. There are certainly still elements of centralization or specifically around the Ethereum foundation and like upgrades to the protocol. But it's, I, I think it's intellectually dishonest to say like Ethereum is more centralized than it was four years ago. And if you look at kind of the current crop of startups, I think the kind of probably two most prominent examples that are, are clearly going through this, this evolution right now in a very uh, distinct way are Maker and Compound, um, which I think Maker a few days ago announced, you know, they said, hey, we're going to dissolve the Maker Foundation yeah. and make the thing a, a pure DAO, right? Uh, and that was announced very directly. And, you know, Maker started pretty centralized and V2 is more decentralized and it's going to kind of just keep going from there. Compound basically did the same thing, right? Where they announced, I think, their comp token and that's going to become the governance protocol or whatever for, you know, the, the, the governance token for the Compound Protocol. And so we're seeing that kind of happen in a real-time way with now with Maker and Compound. I think generally speaking, that model will you know be common across kind of everything you see in crypto. And I think we'll see other, I think Binance is kind of another interesting example in this category where today it's more certainly more centralized than Maker or Compound. I don't really think that's a question, but also the scale they operate at is very different and the service they're providing is very different, but you can start to see them on the margin start to decentralize things. Um, so they added a peer-to-peer trading protocol um, they added Binance Dex, which they can continue to iterate with and experiment with. And, and, and you can see kind of other um, vectors in which this continues to be the case. And so um, I, I generally am optimistic that for teams that believe in the, their future of being decentralized, they need to kind of pick which things to start with centralized and then move in the decentralized direction. Um, and, and there's clear clear evidence that this, this has happened for the biggest protocols and some of the biggest companies in the space. And I, I expect those to continue moving in the right direction. Yeah, and look, I think it just makes sense. If, if, any, if anybody's had any involvement in startups, you know that you're likely to pivot all over the place in the early stages. And um, in these instances, just from an engineering perspective, if you kind of hard code assumptions into a system without first validating them, you're, you're kind of creating this fragility. And of course, that's then compounded by uh, devolving a lot of decision-making or upgradability upgrades on chain. Um, so obviously, these are tough times at the moment. We're in uncharted waters uh, across wider capital markets. That's having an impact in venture and based on all the indicators that we've seen, most impact in early stage venture because, you know, VC firms are just kind of doubling down or supporting their invest- existing investments. So as an investor, if you were to be looking at an early stage project, what are you what are you looking for? What is still investable uh, in these times? Or, or are you kind of just holding off on that stage of investment until, you know, there, there's clarity on what's happening at the macro level? Yeah, so um, I, I don't think seed vest investing um, is that materially impacted by the current macro environment. Valuations will come down a little bit, certainly. But for teams that their burn rate is close to zero right now, like, it, you know, like everyone knows that you need to keep your burn rate low right now, especially, right? Um, and typically seed stage teams are five people or less anyways. So maybe those five person teams turn into four person teams. Um, but like operationally, that's just not very difficult to, to you know, operationalize, right? And so I'm, I'm not terribly worried about the seed environment. The check sizes are small enough. The absolute dollars are small enough. The number of people are small enough. That, that market kind of continues to run unabated other than the fact that just valuations will come down. But that market operates pretty well. The, the stage of the market that's the most concerning are people who have a meaningful burn rate. Uh, they're not cash flow positive. But they they you know need to raise a large amount of dollars at some you know reasonably hefty valuation to keep going. Those are the companies most at risk. Um, in crypto, that typically looks at like Series A and Series B stage companies and startups are probably the most at risk. The people who are later stage, the C's and the D's, those folks, they're probably cash flow positive or they're close enough to cash flow positive that they can get there. Um, right. Maybe with some job cuts or something, but they have a reasonably clear path to get there. It's the folks who are who are in the A and the B stage who are probably the most at risk. And so we've been you know calling. Um, you know, we a few weeks ago went through this exercise where we went through our, our entire portfolio, um, you know, called up all the CEOs and, you know, made sure we understood their cash positions, made, made sure we understood their burn rates, um, and then kind of, set, you know, strategized with them to ensure that they are kind of at the right stage, that they're making sure they have the kind of the right precautions they're taking 
to ensure they can um, minimize risk to their, their businesses and, and their teams. Um, so we've been pretty proactive about that um, for our current portfolio. As it pertains to you know, new investments on a go-forward basis, we are absolutely still writing checks. We, um, we issued a term sheet a couple of weeks ago. We uh, are uh, last week agreed uh, to participate in a new round for a separate company. Um, and we were, were issuing another term sheet, I think, later this week. So uh, we are very much still writing checks at kind of all stages on a go-forward basis. So we're, we're excited about where things are and the opportunities to build. Interesting. Well, I'm sure a lot of people starting out will be buoyed by, um, by hearing that sentiment. So whenever we've um, spoken in the past, whilst you have uh, a great kind of framing and thesis, you've also uh, seemed to be both quite pragmatic and opportunistic. Um, so compared to some VCs that we speak to who have quite an, a narrow field, you know, they, they'll only invest in gaming and they won't invest in DeFi or what are the type of opportunities that you're looking for? Broadly speaking, there are kind of two forms of investing. There's thesis driven top down investing and there's kind of bottoms up uh, opportunistic investing. Um, and, and we do both. With One thing that's become clear to me being in crypto for about four years now is that there are applications for trust minimization that I could not have previously for, forecasted. So a good example would be kind of Helium, uh, what we're doing there, or like LivePeer, for example, or Arweave. I could have never conceived of those use cases when I got in crypto in 2016. I certainly won't claim that I understood what DeFi would be in 2016 when I got into crypto, but it was clear to me that smart contracts were going to have an impact on finance, and there were going to be direct financial applications, and there was going to be some way to introduce trust minimization in the finance, right? And even back in 2016, anyone who was an Ethereum pro, you know, understood that in a very vague sense, even though there was no concrete, you know, instantiations of that. And so kind of having realized that evolution over the last few years, we, we've been very clear with ourselves that we need to be open-minded about this technology and what it can do, because there are smart people all over the space with different backgrounds and different expertise who look at crypto and they say, huh, I can apply this trust minimization thing in my industry in this new way that no one's ever thought of before. Right. Um, and I think some of our best investments are likely to be people who did that uh, we are super, super convicted about Helium, which we invested in about a year ago. And that, that opportunity was so orthogonal to everything else we've ever done. Um, but we understood on a first principles basis how to think about why it needed to be trust minimized, what the impacts were on the, the kind of business model. And we're able to kind of devise a token economic system to, to accrue value to the underlying token. And so we've been fortunate to, to have the right background to do that. And so in areas like Helium, let's say, we did not have a thesis there before. Um, and it was, it was kind of opportunistic. But conversely, uh, for example, we are very excited about the opportunity for uh, decentralized uh, BitMEX. And so we actually made an, uh, you know, investment, gave word to a team last week to invest in a company in that space. We've been looking for someone in that space for about six months and we finally pulled the trigger there. And so we do both types of investing. Uh, we don't want to be closed minded. Uh, the thesis stuff is more fun because we, we develop conviction and then we go, go search for it, right? Um, but you never know. People knock on our door with all kinds of weird stuff, um, and we love to look at it. That's right. Awesome. Well, look, thanks very much for your time, Carl. It's great to have you on, and you know, thanks for all the work you and your team do in, in helping move forward the space and, and help people frame and understand it. We certainly use a lot of your thinking to inform ours, so thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Jamie, thanks so much for having me on. This was a blast. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission of Web3.